Thank you. Good afternoon. Welcome everyone. This meeting of the Board of Chiropractic Examiners is being held by teleconference. The date is Friday, May 20th, 2022, and the time is 12.03 p.m. We will confirm the teleconference meeting locations during roll call. The Board's paramount responsibility is to protect the health, welfare, and safety of the public through licensure, education, and enforcement in chiropractic care. Please be aware that this meeting is being recorded. Please turn off or silence all cell phones. We will now take roll call and uh, confirm meeting locations uh, for the board members. Mr. Sweet, would you please call the roll? Sure. Uh, Dr. Paris? Yes, here at Department of Consumer Affairs, El Dorado Room, 1625 North Market Street, Suite N220, Sacramento, California, 95834. Great, Dr. Adams. Uh, present, I am located at 101 Andrick Street in Sonoma, California, 95476. And I, Rafael Sweet, am present. I am located at 5250 Lincoln Boulevard, Suite 500, North Hollywood, California, 91601. Um, Ms. Cruz. Present, I am located at 6201 S Street on the third floor in Sacramento, zip code 95817. And Dr. Daniels. Present, and I'm located at 1165 Park Avenue in San Jose. I believe that's all we have for today. Thank you, Mr. Sweet. Moving to agenda item number two, review discussion and possible action on proposal to amend the board's fee schedule, business and professions code section 1006.5. And uh, I'd like to invite Ms. Walker, who has a presentation for us. Yes, thank you. Um, so I'm here today with uh, Renee Milano from the department's budget office. We're gonna provide, um, or I'm gonna provide a brief presentation um, walking the board through some policy questions that we have relating to our fee schedule and fee proposal. Um, and then from that, I will return it back to the board for discussion. If there's any questions while I'm delivering my presentation, um, feel free to jump in or otherwise, I'd like to just give an overview of the three issues and then return it back to the board. Um, so beginning with, um, next slide please. So at the, at the April 22nd board meeting, uh, the department's budget office gave us an overview of our fund condition. Um, the takeaway there is that despite our efforts to closely monitor and limit our expenses, our increased operating costs and our enforcement costs are continuing to outpace the annual revenue that we're receiving through our regulatory fees. And without an increase in revenue, as shown in the red box, we're project our fund is actually projected to become insolvent in fiscal year 23-24. Next slide, please. Um, to substantiate the concerns that we had with our fee, um, with our fund condition, last year BCE um, went through a fee, fee study with Matrix Consulting Group, where they conducted a fee analysis to determine what, how we should set our fees based on our actual expenditures and workload. Um, based on the analysis, BCE Matrix concluded that BCE is under recovering approximately 1.4 million dollars per year, and the majority of those fees relate specifically to our continuing education program. Next slide. The proposed fee schedule that was developed by Matrix Consulting Group has been presented to the board multiple times. As you can see by looking at the fee schedule, um, we're really, what they've done through this analysis is they've realigned each of our fees with what they've determined to be the actual cost of us providing those services. And next slide. For purposes of today's discussion, we're really looking at two fees. One, the continuing education course application fee, and second is the annual Doctor of Chiropractic license renewal fee. 
Um, so I'm going to begin with there's the three policy issues that are going to be discussed today. I'm going to begin with continuing education. Um, as you're aware, the board um, approves CE providers who then submit applications for each course to the board for review and approval. We currently charge a flat rate of $56 per course, and that is limited to one subject area per course. Taking a look, next slide. Taking a look at our 2021 work workload, last year we processed over 2,000 course applications comprising almost 10,500 hours of education. Of those courses, the average came to five hours per course with a median of three hours per course, but the most common course application that we received was from providers who were offering a one hour course. And as far as looking at the range of what we received that year, we, it ranged from 15 minutes to a course that spanned 86 hours. And also looking at what, that, what did that workload look like in terms of the subject areas that we were evaluating, about 30% of our applications were related to the mandatory subject areas, such as ethics and law, chiropractic adjustive technique, um, ethical billing and coding, whereas about 70% of the, the other 70% of the workload was for courses that were in other subject areas, more general continuing education that can be used to satisfy the other um, 16 hours of CE. And looking at what that spread of course applications look like, this, this bar graph is demonstrating the number of hours per, cor per course for those applications. And looking at the spread, you can see that it's heavily concentrated in courses that were up to two hours. And then again, there's a bump when you're looking around six hours, um, and then it really levels off once you get past 12 hours. We found that 92% of the courses that we, that we, course applications that we received consisted of up to 12 hours of instruction. And that brings us to the first policy issue that the board is gonna be asked to discuss today is relating to how do you assess the fee for that for the, a single course application? Currently under our structure, we, we use a flat rate fee of $56 per course, which Matrix has concluded is significantly under recovering our cost for administrating our CE program. And their proposal is um, a flat rate course of increasing to $558. But another option that they've presented in their analysis would be to go with an hourly rate based on the hours of instruction at $116. And another alternative to also consider is if you want to charge an hourly rate and then cap it at a certain amount, then we've presented some options there on what those numbers would look like. The reason we bring this back to the board was um, in early April when Dr. Paris and I uh, met with stakeholders at um, a legislative event, there were concerns with charging the $558 for the flat rate course on someone that's only gonna be offering one or two hours of CE, maybe a lunch and learn type event, it's gonna place a significant burden and make it difficult for them to continue offering the programs that they offer. So that's why we're, we're now bringing it back to the board to, to take another look on whether it should be a flat rate or it should be an hourly rate. So that's the first issue that will be asked. Are there any specific questions or should I continue through all of the issues? I have a quick question, Kristen, and, and I can hold it for later or ask it now while we're on this slide if you would like. Uh, go ahead. So my, my question is, are we are these just suggested hours or are these or, or, or are we tied to these hours? These hourly rates of 125, 140, 150, are those just suggestions that you have? Those are options, but those are based on those are based on getting to the same number that you get with the five hundred and fifty eight dollars per course or one hundred and sixteen hours with no cap or if you, it's getting to the same number in the analysis by matrix. So they're, they're suggestions, but they're based on actual analysis of the numbers to get to the same target. Okay. All right, thank you. But we're not, we're not tied to those and we're not necessarily tied to that $558 fee, correct? Even though okay. that's been suggested. But if we start even though it's been suggested, you're not tied to that rate specifically, but those numbers came from their analysis and determining what our continuing education program costs. So if we start reducing those, if we reduce that cost somewhere, we're gonna have to raise it in a different fee, such as the annual DC license renewal fee to make right. up the difference. We can't simply reduce in one area without making up the difference somewhere else. 
Gotcha. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I have a question. This is Dr. Paris. So it's my impression then is that if there, the hourly rate with the fee cap would, um, is anything over 12 hours if a provider submits for over 12 hours and it is thus capped, that then that has to be subsidized somewhere else. And, and is that anticipated? Where, where does that, how are we accounting for that in the? That, that's budget? correct. That's correct. So if, if it's, if you move beyond just a simple hourly rate and you start putting a maximum fee cap, you can see that in the hourly rates with the fee cap that when you do that, it makes the first X amount of hours of CE cost more. So instead of $116 per hour, we would have to basically subsidize anything over 12 hours by increasing the cost for the first 12 hours to 125. And you see that scale continue to increase. Whereas if you set the cap at six hours at $900, you've got to pay $150 per hour for the first six. So that's, that's where that. So we're back to uh, the concerns that the state association that you mentioned, um, the concerns that the lower volume CE providers are subsidizing essentially higher volume CE providers because Perfect. of the cap. Correct. Yeah, that is one. That is one consideration when you start talking about a fee cap. You're getting close to the same with the flat rate per course, where people on the higher end of offering more hours are actually being subsidized by the providers of one to two hour courses. Thank you. The second policy issue that we've brought to the board for discussion today is. Um, should, the, should BCE continue to charge the same fee to renew an active or an inactive license? This is common throughout the department with the healing arts boards. The majority of them do charge the same rate for, uh, to renew a license, whether it's active or an inactive status. And that was, that's the proposal that's within the matrix consulting group report is that for the annual doctor of chiropractic license renewal, the fee should be $336 regardless of the license status. Um, we did just want to make the board aware of the Senate Bill 1031 proposal, which would make the inactive licensee, license fee half of that of an active license. And we're just showing the estimated fees that would be needed to cover our costs should that occur. We would then need to increase the fee for an active license to $366 and then make an inactive license half that, which would be 183. Um, and that's based on an assumption that our active and inactive licensee populations remain the same. Um, and it also, this is also the second policy issue and the third are very closely tied together. Um, the third issue is if the board should pursue another fee increase with the fees set in statute as what you're seeing in business and professions code section 1006.5, where it simply states for each of our fees, the fee shall be with a fixed dollar amount um, and contrast that with the California Acupuncture Board recently did a fee increase, and that's the other language that the, within the packet gives you, a, gives you an idea of what that looks like. And they've got within there certain fees that are set in statute, but then they also have some flexibility with their annual um, acupuncturist license renewal where it sets the fee, but provides authority through regulation to increase it further to ensure uh, the financial stability of that board. Um, so two and three go together, but it's something that staff is bringing to the board's attention and would like you to keep in mind that if we move forward with um, just simply a fixed rate for the DC license renewal fee, um, we may be in a position where um, should SB 1031 pass, we're going to be in a fiscal position where we're still under recovering approximately $200,000 per year. Whereas if we, if we pursue something similar to what the acupuncture board has and we request authority to further adjust through regulation, it would give us a mechanism to ensure more long-term stability for the board's fund. Um, so with that, I'd like to return it back to the board for any questions. And I do have a representative from the budget office here in this room, and then we have another one on the line. If there's any very specific budget questions, they'd be happy to assist us with. Walker, can I ask a question just for the board's clarification? So 
and looking at business and professions code section 1006.5, it seems to place a statutory cap on these fees. Um, you know, if, if the board is inclined to kind of raise its fees, are you asking for the board's authority to kind of seek an author, author and kind of pursue a legislative amendment to increase those fees? Because I don't think you could do it by regulation above these amounts here. Yes, um, we're, we, need to find, we need to find a vehicle to make this fee increase happen. Mm -hmm. um, so from today's meeting, we need the board to answer the policy question so that we have that, that fixed fee schedule or the, the, the proposal that the board would like us to find an author for so that we can get that in legislation this year, ideally either through our sunset bill or if there's another author that's willing to, to carry this for us. Sure. Thank you. Um, Jeanette, uh, Board Member Cruz, question on um, the prior slide uh, with SB, I believe, 1031. There it is. I'm interested to know how far along the, where is the SB 1031 in the process right now? Uh, if, if this is kind of part of our discussion, and I'd be interested to know how far, <laughs> how far into its process and review has has it gotten to potentially become reality? It's still making its way through the process. It's currently in the Appropriations Committee. I know okay. that there's a number of the DCA boards, ourselves included, have concerns with the fiscal impact. Mm -hmm. um, so it's hard to tell at now how far it's going to go, but it's still relatively early in the process. Okay. Um, this is Andrea McMillan. I'm the board's policy analyst. So I wanted to also add um, that it's like uh, Ms. Walker said, it's in uh, the Appropriations Committee um, in the Senate. And um, it's placed on suspense file, meaning that um, the author and the committee members will further discuss this bill to address any issues like Ms. Walker stated. Um, a lot of boards are concerned with the fiscal impact because it may not be absorbable. Um, this is not a one spot, one uh, size fits all type of approach. And um, so the, the author is currently working with um, committee members to see what, if there are any changes that would be implemented. Perfect, thank you. So I, I have a I have a question. What so if I, I was just playing with numbers, you know, the last couple of days reviewing um, all this and and you know we have roughly twelve thousand five hundred chiropractors and looking at the acupuncture, you know, to raise our fee a hundred dollars we're still gonna be less than them. That gets us 1.25 million just on that right there. And then if we were to triple or even quadruple our CE fees as they are right now, um, that would get us to, I, my figure was about 6.5 uh, six million eighty thousand, which is over what? So it seems like we don't have to go too high. I mean, just in those two areas alone, if we bumped them up that little bit, I mean, we're. I think our our um, our license fee is, and even if we got, you know, if this ten thirty one goes through and they get cut in half, uh, we would still be in a good position, and then we can shift things other areas. I mean, I, I, I guess uh, not understanding the, the, the process being new, how, how long this takes, but it seems like focusing on two areas is the best idea, and those seem to be the biggest. And obviously, I know we're talking about getting our costs of enforcement down too, um, which I think was talked about before about, you know, doing more desk enforcement instead of having just the high cost of of, of you know going out on site different things like that so i think in a combination we probably would be able to get there and not have to you know make this too complicated but maybe i'm simplifying so dr adams to clarify so for the so for the fee schedule that matrix has brought to us um the idea behind it is to realign all the fees as proposed by matrix but then there's only specific questions for the board today 
on the CE course application fee and then also the annual license renewal fee. So if the board has any questions or concerns about any of the other proposed fees, we should discuss that as well. Um, but that had been discussed a few times at board meetings and the board was moving forward with everything until we got the, the significant concerns about our CE course application fee. Well, I, no, I'm, I'm aware, I'm, I mean, I've been reading this matrix study. This is the first time, as I recall, that we've gotten down to nitty gritty suggestions as to what, what we need to do. And that's why I'm asking about our flexibility is, um, you know, do we have to take this proposed as it is, you know, like, you know, 366 or 336, or can we modify it in another way? Because, I mean, I think that Dr. Parrish brings up a good point that if most of our courses are one hour, um, it might be very cost prohibitive to have, you know, a flat fee. So they go into the hourly fee, but then, you know, you've also got the, the, the backside of it too. So I, it seems like we should be able to, to meet somewhere in the middle of that. This is, uh, this is Dr. Pear. So I just, yeah, I just want to clarify. I, 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 I I feel like the most equitable way to, uh, you know, recover our costs and, and our uh, workload expenses at, you know, through staff is, is to have this um, kind of use, so kind of a use fee. And so those, and we heard clearly from uh, some stakeholders recently that, you know, their ability to subsidize um, the larger CE providers by either capping those fees or having uh, a single rate was going to really harm their ability to provide CE to our licensees, and and seemingly having a one hour of if you only have one hour of CE, and we know that that um, you know aligns with our full cost of approving those CE applications, um, my, my thought is, is that it's, it really seemingly represents the most fair and equitable way to, uh, you know, align the fee schedule. I don't know if I implied something else there previously. If I did, I've, I've changed my, my opinion. I hope that's okay. What do you what do you mean by that implied? You mean like my you mean my take on you? Yeah, I don't know if I inferred something else previously, but I I, I I'm just stating the way I feel about it today right now. Okay. Well, I, I mean, I I, yeah. I I I agree. I'm just wondering though, if you know that that big shift from 56 to um which could be up to, you know, the full course. I mean, I can't imagine, obviously that's not reasonable for a $56 to be paid for an $86 course. I mean, an 86 hour course, you know, there's gotta be something done. But I just wonder if the stakeholders had said anything about, um, you know, $1,500 for a 12 hour program. If that, if that would become prohibitive since most of them are one hour to six hours. Yeah, I think, um, I think we'll have an opportunity for them to, uh, we'll hear from our stakeholders on that question. It's a good question. And, I, and just one other comment about the CE. I mean, obviously, I think if we get uh, a better instruction and and uh, and decrease the amount of time that staff has to spend on some of these courses, um, which is what we're trying to do with the CE, I think we can reduce, particularly courses that. Um, I mean, I'd be curious to know how many courses are just have been approved already, and then basically don't change and get reapproved from year to year. Are we still are, are is is that is this fee increase going to apply to that every year, even though they have the same course that's already been approved? So the work of of 
of stuff that's already been addressed. So, uh, under the current regulations that we have for continuing education course applications, they go through the same review process, regardless of whether it's the first time applying for a course or if they've offered it multiple times. It, we don't currently have another pathway for doing something similar to more, a more expedited renewal of an existing course. So under this proposal, yes, you'd be paying the same fee, regardless of whether it was the first time um, submitting a course or multiple times. I think you know, it's something that the committee could discuss as part of the comprehensive um, continuing education regulations is whether there is some type of renewal pathway for courses and what that would look like. That's something we'd have to take to the committee and address it through that. So that that certainly would be less of less demand on staff if those courses are are essentially not changing. So something to think about. Yes, thank you. Uh, Dr. Adams, I is is that is that somewhat referring to what you were asking earlier about what the pathway might be for some flexibility in the fees um, or more equitable alignment of the fees later on? No, I was specifically referring to the fact that, um, you know, I, I was just thinking about, 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 you know, going from, you know, what, what that would do to, um, if that's going to discourage people from coming forward and, 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 Providing CE, if you if you have a jump from fifty six to fifteen hundred dollars for you know a you know I guess for a, a six hour course it would be um, you know five hundred and fifty and um, no am I reading that right no six hour course would be uh, what seven fifty yeah seven half the so seven fifty for a six hour course and then fifteen hundred for a twelve or a client you know. Because most people are either going to do one, two, or they tend to go to six and then twelve. That's my experience anyway. Um, from a standpoint of of required uh, CEs, so I was just thinking, you know, if that if that's going to discourage, if you go from fifty six to fifteen hundred, potentially, or to seven fifty. We we could end up yeah, decreasing I, revenue. We could end up decreasing revenue, and of course, that would decrease staff time as well. So that might where our, our staff are, are somewhat fixed costs, right? Because their salary, they're just spending an exorbitant amount of time, I guess. One of the things to think about. Sorry, this is Dixie Van Allen. Um, is that Right now, we are basing these fees um, on our current process, which is in our regular. Do change. Um, I, I don't think we can really discuss how the regulations will change um, in conjunction with this um, fee discussion because we are bound by what's currently in our regulations. Does that make sense? So perhaps there just needs to be maybe there needs needs to be some clarity on 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 what we can and or should or what it is that the staff is looking for right now. I guess that's my big question. What is it that we need to do right now to get this ball rolling? Because we certainly need to get it rolling. Sure. Um, to clarify, so what so what staff needs from the board at today's meeting is a final fee schedule that you would like to move forward with. So that we can ensure solvency in our fund by pursuing a fee increase um, and specific to CE, we need to know if the board for continuing education course applications, if the board wants to charge a flat rate of $558 per course, or if the board wants to charge an hourly rate of $116 per hour of instruction, if you want to go with any of those other proposals that we have on that slide, 
or if the board wants to come up with any other method to fund CE, um, if we go beyond those numbers, we have to start looking at other fees to subsidize the difference because the cost remains the same. So if we if we want to make a flat rate that's lower than five hundred and fifty eight dollars, we're going to have to find we're going to have to increase a fee somewhere else to make up the difference. Or with that, if we go with an hourly rate, if we want it to be less than one hundred and sixteen, we're going to have to start looking probably at the primary DC license renewal fee to go up to make up the difference. So the idea behind the matrix proposal is that each of the programs is self-funding and that we're recovering appropriate fees to cover the cost of providing those services. So that's where they've come up with these numbers. And it's, it's the policy issue that you're having right now that staff needs a final decision on after this meeting. And you've, both you and Dr. Paris bring up great points. Um, the concern with the flat rate of $558 per course is that those providers of the smaller types of events that you know can reach quite a few licensees. But if it's a if it's a lunch and learn one hour course, are they going to submit those to the board if they have to pay $558? But like you've brought up on the flip side, is if you have a 12 hour course and it's costing you close to $1,000 to submit that application, are you going to submit that or are you going to submit just a bunch of one hour courses. Um, so that's, that's the policy issue for discussion by the board is, is it equitable to charge per hour of instruction based on the staff time to review each hour or should there be a flat rate per course? Um, and that's, that's the decision that has to be made on this issue. And my question and is, I, is I, we, my, oh, sorry, go ahead, Dave. Dr. Paris, sorry. No, please, please. No, I, and so that, that gets back to my original question. Do I, 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 my personal feeling is that I think that we can shift some of it. I think, I think, I, I personally think that the best way to go is to go to a standard hourly rate. But I think that standard hourly rate could be lowered so that that way it becomes so that the, the, the smaller people are not subsidizing the, 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 the bigger courses, and I think that we should shift. I think the two areas, the licensing fee and the uh, and the CE, I mean, I think an hourly rate of something closer to say like, you know, 85 or $90 per hour or something in that ballpark, and then increase our licensing fee. I think we could easily go from 371 471. I mean, acupuncture is charging 500 with a cap of up to 750. I think our fees are are certainly. I don't see that being that all of a sudden we're going to have chiropractors not renewing their license because they're paying $100 more in a full year. And I think that that could get us there based on what I have $100 times 1200, 12,500 chiropractors gets us 1.2 million and then increasing our our CEs I just I just tripled the the amount from the 133 that we're getting now and tripled it and that got us to 6 million 80 which gets us solvent so obviously going to $80 per hour of instruction and increasing our fee by 100 we wouldn't have to touch anything else and we'd be there just just that was just some simple calculations I had done today I don't know if that's even doable or if we have to do some other thing, but I'm just saying that that seemed reasonable to me based on putting those acupuncture figures in there. I, so, uh, Dr. Adams, there's a few things there, so I just want to be clear. I, one, I was hearing that you are saying that the hourly rate at 116 per hour, you would you would desire to see that lower. Yeah, I think I think that okay. I think seeing that a little bit lower um, balances the the one to two hour lunch and learn and and what a lot of like and the CCA does a lot of two hour seminars for their groups. Um, it won't be cost prohibitive to those small groups that do a lot of good for our for our chiropractors licensees in different locations, and also for the bigger courses that are going to bring in two three hundred people can certainly afford to do you know, um, 80 to $90 an hour. I think that's, I think that's very doable and equitable. 
So I, I would have two, two um, discussion points there. One would be um, the consideration that if we lower the um, hourly rate from 116, which is actually our cost, that's based on just recovering our staff costs, um, and we then contemplate subsidizing that by raising the license renewal fees, I, I'm afraid that in effect, we are asking our licensee, our licensees to subsidize CE providers. We're asking our licensees to pay more so that the cottage industry of continuing education in chiropractic can prosper. And I, I, I respect that there may be a access um, discussion there and the ability to have more CE and, um, but I don't, I don't think we're seeing enough of a access issue to CE, especially as we come out of COVID and there's been a number of face-to-face uh, -face CE events, et cetera. I seem to be seeing more access than less. So that would be my concern is that we, we would under recover our cost number one. And then if we choose to subsidize it, we're subsidizing it um, through our licensees. And I, I, I just, my initial reaction as a licensee is I bristled because I, I felt it would be wholly unfair to know that I was paying extra to subsidize um, continuing education providers and their business model. But I do respect what you said earlier about how will this affect them and, and that surely there's, as, as we um, modify our fees, there might be some business model changes um, but I think that's the nature of being in business, much like a private practitioner would do as they dealt with fee changes, you know, in their own office. I I concur. Yeah, I, I, I wasn't thinking of it in terms of, of the licensees subsidizing it. So that's a great point. I wasn't thinking of it that way. I was thinking of more like what we were talking about earlier about the cost per hour and that being prohibitive to the smaller people that are just doing one to two hours. I think I was thinking yeah, along those I, I was thinking on, I was thinking along those lines. Um, and but also I, I I do think that we could and you know again it's just that was just me throwing out those two numbers that seem to be um, you know when I particularly when I saw the acupuncture license fee at 500 I thought you know our our fee at 331 or 371 seems seems low. And I think that, you know, I mean, I think that chiropractors can afford, you know, and that that little bit more if that helps keep the, the board solvent and gets us in the in the in the in the black, you know, going forward. I think that's also important too. But I mean, I'm I'm not married. I'm just that was just my thought. I mean, 116 per hour. People are gonna people are gonna make their choice, as you said, business wise. That's the cost of doing business. You're absolutely right. And I think it's fair. Thank you for that. Um, I think it's fair to remind everyone on the call also that I think we forget that this is um, this is a uh, application um, to do CE for 12. 12 months. So, you know, we often reflect it as because we talk about it in one hour or as many hours with a cap, et cetera. But these courses are offered multiple times. So you potentially have a $116 fee that can then be utilized and uh, multiple, you know, at multiple sessions, multiple times for 12 months. So it really is that I would imagine not being in that business, but I would imagine their business model is reflective on that this is a uh, one time, you know, kind of hard cost, but then they're able to um, have 12 months of utilization for all those courses. It kind of makes it feel a little bit less when you think about it as being, you know, one hour of instruction, but they're not only going to use it one time, you know, there's not a date. It's not May 20th, 12 to 1 o'clock. I paid $116 for that. It's, it's May 20th till $116, and you get to do that hour wherever you can or, you know, uh, till May 19th of 2023. 
Good point. Dr. Oh, I see um, Dr. Daniels has her hand up. Yeah, hi, Dr. Paris. Um, so is this the time that we're discussing this issue or did Kristen have more in the presentation and then we're discussing it um, at the end? Uh, this is the discussion. Do you have any questions, Dr. Daniels? I don't have uh, questions. I just have, you know, comments or opinions. So I didn't know if this is the time or if we were kind of waiting to do this after the full presentation. Um, I, I actually did go through the slides and then we went back. So I think I think for purposes of um, getting through this discussion, I think we should open it for the CE course application fee as we've been discussing. Um, and I'll return it back to Dr. Paris. Yeah, I think um, feel free, Dr. Daniels, we'd like to hear from you. Okay, um, I mean, a couple of things. It's, you know, it's a business. And if you are charging under what it costs you to do it, you're not going to stay in business. So as much as, you know, a fee may seem unreasonable, uh, you know, the board's going to be insolvent. So we need to figure that out. So I'm, I think it's reasonable for, you know, an hourly fee and at minimum, it has to be what it costs the board and DCA to uh, review it. Um, I agree with Dr. Adams. I, I think there should be an expedited renewal process for courses that have already been in existence. Um, however, I do disagree with, you know, if the course is staying the same, I don't think a course should stay the same. I think a course should be changing somewhat every year because otherwise you're teaching something that's antiquated uh, and may be antiquated, may not be. So I do really think if we could get an expedited um, way for people who are doing CEs uh, that they still need to be reviewed, um, they should be making some changes and unless it's a huge change, they can go into the expedited um, pathway. But I do think that classes should be changing. They should be evolving with recent literature and kind of what's going on. Um, and, you know, I don't, obviously I'm new and I don't know, you know, the time or what is involved with the approval process. Um, but if there's, obviously we need to see if we can streamline the number of hours that it's taking staff. And I don't know what resources they need uh, in order to do that if the board uh, you know, assist in that way at all. If there's confusion as to kind of what a topic means and what category it goes into, et cetera. Um, and, you know, $366 as a licensee who's practicing is, you know, I, I think even just the proposal of that increase of $30 is reasonable. And I actually agree with Dr. Adams as far as it, it could be even more, um, I actually am in favor of the inactive licensees having a reduced fee. And I know the bill says 50%. And I think someone mentioned that they were taking suggestions. I'm not sure why it has to be 50% reduced versus 60% or 75% reduced. Um, you know, even though they're a smaller number, I think we do want to keep those, you know, because some people go inactive for a period of time, whether it's health or finances. We really don't want to lose those licensees if it, you know, becomes burdensome for them. Um, and as an active licensee, you know, if that's the case, I don't mind. You know, personally, if you're a busy practitioner paying a hundred extra dollars a year in order to keep kind of the group moving together, um, so I I'm in favor of the hourly rate. I think a flat fee is just. It's just not reasonable and it's not reasonable to charge what we've been charging for these 12 hour courses. Um, and I think that's all. Oh, and I just in general, I know Dr. Adams, you were mentioning just, we we're just talking about the two, but I think the, um, and I think maybe others agree that the whole fee schedule when you compare it to kind of acupuncture, the whole fee schedule needs to be adjusted, especially when you see the negative numbers with petitioners for re, uh, you know, early termination of, uh, or early reinstatement. I, you know, I don't understand why we're paying for that. Um, that seems a bit sideways. 
Uh, so I just think that the whole thing needs to be revamped, which I think is, you know, not the discussion for today. It's the two main ones. So those are my thoughts. Thank you. Thank you. Right, is there any more discussion from the board members? Just one other comment that uh, Dr. Daniels triggered to me. And yeah, that was one of the other th questions I had is that, you know, in, in going back to your comments, Dr. Ferris, about licensees subsidizing other things, the licensees are definitely subsidizing those requests for uh, early termination and reinstatement of license by a, by a, by a large margin. And, it seemed, and that's one of the things I wrote down also that that fee certainly should be increased. If our costs are, are you know, 300 and something dollars, but it's costing us, you know, $3,700 to do all the background work for staff, that, that fee needs to come way up too. You know, I, I wrote down you know, that those fees could easily be bumped up to $1,000 if not more, to cover that cost if we're trying to talk about bringing actual cost of things in, in line. And I don't know when we, when we address that or yeah, I'm I'm just dealing with these two things right now. Um, are, are you referring to the, uh, for example, the uh, the petition for early termination of proba probation or reduction of penalty fee, like that line, and the petition for reinstatement of a revoked license yes. fee. Yeah, I, I, and I know they're yeah. not high cost, but at least those are those are areas that we can recover some things. Yes. So, do you, I mean, I my understanding is our total cost per unit, um, as demonstrated. And the recommended from matrix, the 3,195 for the first and 4,185 for the second. If if voted on um, to adopt their fee schedule, that is that aligns with um, cost recovery for us. That's my understanding. Am I? Yes. We need anyone to complain? I'd like to just as a point of clarification. So for purposes of this meeting. Um, when we're talking about the fee schedule, we're talking about changing each and every one of the board's fees to realign it based on the matrix uh, conclusion. So that table that's in your packet on in the cover page, that's the proposal as it currently stands based on the matrix um, based on the matrix analysis. And the takeaway from this meeting is that um, staff didn't those other fees weren't found to be all that controversial. It's just realigning our costs with what, modernizing them so that we're, that we're recovering what it costs to provide those services. But then specific to the CE course application fee, the flat rate fee, and then looking at the license renewal fee, those were the only two where there may be some policy issues that they could be further adjusted. So the takeaway that staff is looking from for the board at this meeting is to adopt an entire fee schedule um, including making decisions on the CE course application fee rate and then the license renewal fee. If, does that okay. make okay. more sense to you, Dr. Adams? Okay. If, okay. So maybe I maybe I missed it somewhere in there. I apologize. I so 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 these all these fees are going to be adjusted up or down depending on what the fee matrix was. Correct. As okay. presented in the proposed I, I, I schedule, now, I would say though it's worth. I would say I think I think one thing that needs clarification is is that the uh, the continuing education course fee is what we're deciding. Will it look like it does on the proposed fee schedule, or will it go to an hour a per oh, unit, a uh, one hour unit of one sixteen? Gotcha. That's the okay. decision. That yeah. yeah, yeah. I I I am I am clear with you now. So so you're saying the continuing education provider application fee is going to go to two ninety one. So our vote today is all these fees are going to go to where they are. The only difference is that we're separating out the hourly um, and then the license fee. So I, I am in complete agreement with that. I, I, I see what you're saying now. I got you. Thank Makes you. Sense. Yeah, thank Makes you. Sense. Sorry, I didn't, I didn't really clarify it well enough in the beginning. I apologize. Uh, well, I, I mean, I read over everything and it wasn't clear to me what exactly we were going to be voting on. So now I'm clear about that. Um, and so I guess my only thing is I think the, 
the license renewal fee could go up a little bit more. That's all I'll say that. And if that means what gets us gets us more solvent down the road and gets us to where we have more, I think make that move now. I do, I will say this, I am in favor of having the regulations like the acupuncture board does that say, for example, you know, our fee is 336, but can go up to, you know, 550, you know, if it requires, because I think we should have that flexibility, um, you know, to help us meet future costs that, that are definitely coming down the pipe, obviously. So I, I'm in favor of that language, if that's something that we can include in this process. Thank you. And I Is want there to any say, more discussion? Oh yeah, just just uh, real quick. I want to say I, I'm aligned with what is kind of where where we're landing so far, um, and I agree that we I would want to kind of look at the language, as well. Uh, what Dr. Adams had mentioned, um, and where my focus for that particular is where that what particular Senate bill is going to land. That if uh, something's going to land a certain way, I want to make sure we have the ability, to, the flexibility to adjust when and where needed, um, and Yes, thank you. Thank you. Regarding the bill, it's my understanding and and that's um, that's agenda item number three for us too. Um, just if if it helps, uh, the my understanding is that we we can discuss that further and, and uh, Ms. McMillan will give us a an overview and a presentation on that. But that's, you know, we can also have a discussion about that particular bill as we're currently neutral. And um, it sounds like perhaps we can discuss our, 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 our position and, and any amendments that we might, um, you know, relay back or suggested amendments. I'm, I'm assuming that we could do that in their agenda item three. Is, is there any more discussion from the board members? Where do you guys see the hands up? Very small. The hands are. There. I apologize. I didn't bring my my proper glasses. Uh, okay. I don't see any hands up. If if any board members have anything else, feel free to jump on. Um, and hearing none, moderator, can we please open for public comment? Certainly. We have opened up the WebEx Q and A feature, which will allow for people to type the word comment in the text box and click send. I do see we have a couple of raised hands from our WebEx attendees, but I also need to check in with the in-person locations. Uh, Board Chair Paris, shall I step through the locations? Please, thank you. Thank you. So are there any public comments from the North Market Boulevard Sacramento location? No. Thank you. And Ms. Cruz, are there any public comments from the South S Street Sacramento location? No. Thank you. Mr. Sweet, any comments in North Hollywood? No. Thank you. Dr. Daniels, any comments in San Jose? No. Thank you. Dr. Adams, any comments in Sonoma? No. Thank you. So we do have a couple of requests for comments on WebEx. So the first is going to be Lori Eisenberg. Lori, I'm going to send you a request to unmute your microphone so that you can speak and you'll have three minutes with a 30 second warning. And you're unmuted. Good afternoon, everyone. You can hear me? Yes. Great. Um, so this is Lori Eisenberg. I'm the Director of Postgraduate and Continuing Education at Life Chiropractic College West. Hello to you that I haven't met in person yet. Um, so it's a very significant fee increase. Um, I would have been happy to have been part of any uh, constituent conversations uh, about it, but this is really uh, the first I'm hearing about it. So. I do want to um, agree with the idea of renewals not paying the same amount. And um, I will say that, you know, many of our courses repeat every year. 
And even though the content does adjust based on new knowledge and understanding, the basic outline is the same. Um, so if you see the same outline year after year, that doesn't mean that the finer points are not being adjusted, right? Uh, we don't put every single thing in the outline. We, we put more general description of what we're talking about. So I would really encourage the idea of not repeating these intense fees for renewals year after year. That's one thing. Uh, also, I know that we talked about this a little bit, but the current process of, uh, that the board goes through to, re to review applications from the outside feels very time consuming and inefficient. And so we are basing our calculations on a process that I feel could really be improved and streamlined. And so I feel that we're inflating the cost by doing this analysis based on a process that, that perhaps could be improved. Um, so I feel like we're putting the cart in front of the horse by not improving the process before we raise the fees. Uh, and then my last comment is asking about the, this flat rate. I, I just want to clarify uh, for myself, we're talking about per a course title. The flat rate would be, if we're offering a course with five different subjects, there would be a single application and we would pay that flat rate for the whole course, inclusive of the five different subjects. 30 Is seconds. that correct? Um, because that's not clear to me. And those are my three comments. Thank you all for the amazing work that you do and the time that you put into this uh, committee. Thank you. Thank you. Our next request for comment comes from someone logged in as Dawn Benton. Dawn, I'm going to send you a request to unmute your microphone, and then you will have three minutes to speak. And you're unmuted. From the California Chiropractic Association. And, and first, I want to apologize. I just joined the meeting. I was on a plane flying to our sports symposium location, so I haven't heard anything up until just the last, I would say, 10 minutes. But if, if it's going to be $558 per course, that will kill us. Um, most of our courses are very short, so I hope that you're actually going to be engaging people in dialogue around this and as well as the process and I echo everything Lori just said um, around efficiencies and lack of efficiencies on the renewing side or the reviewing side, but um, yeah, we will be really upset if that's the new price for our courses, the way that we are structured. And since I didn't hear anything early on, I'm going to stop talking now and follow up later and try to find out what I missed. Thank you. Thank you. And there are no further requests for public comment, although I do see Dr. Adams. I can close the Q&A if you're ready. I just, I just was yeah. curious, uh, Dr. Paris, if, if a question could be asked of uh, Ms. Benton relative to uh, the other option of 116 per hour, if that would be something that would be, if she had a comment, if it's not appropriate, that's fine. But I'd be curious to get her input on that, on that other option. She may not have heard okay. that was another option we're discussing. Yeah. Shall I send um, I, Don Benton a request to unmute or is that out of order? Is that okay? She's still on the line? Yes. Yeah, please, if, if you don't mind, um, we can unmute her and uh, let her respond to Dr. Adams. Certainly. And you're unmuted, Don. Thank you. Hi, it's Don again. Um, yeah, absolutely. The 116 per hour would be uh, manageable for us, you know, 
much more so than looking at something like 558 per hour or per two hours. So uh, it's better. It's definitely better. Well, I, and, and I'm just I'm just thinking, Ms. Benton, about the the fact that you know having having you know worked with CCA and organized you know those smaller type things. You know, I just wanted to get your input on that. So you think the 116 hourly rate is more reasonable? Yes. Okay. Thank All you. Right. Yes. Thank you. And I have muted the moderator if there's, again. And there if are there's no, no further other request. Yeah, please, you can uh, please close the public comment. Thank you. Is, is there any more discussion from uh, the board members? Hearing none, if, um, if I could uh, entertain a motion to set the continuing education course application fee to be assessed per hour of instruction at 116 as recommended by matrix and without a cap. Can I entertain a motion for that? This is Rafael Sweet. I'll make a motion to set the uh, hourly rate at $116 per hour of instruction as recommended by matrix. Is there a second? Thank you. Is there a second? This is Dr. Daniels. I second. And is there any discussion? I have a couple comments. Please. Okay. Um, so, I mean, I hear the stakeholders, you know, it, it seems like, a, you know, no one likes a fee increase. Um, I, I guess one of the things is, you know, the fee from my understanding has been very minimal for a very long time and it's, I, I guess I would wonder how it would be possible for the board to stay solvent uh, with just, you know, uh, inflation and increased in cost of, you know, everything. Yes, I mean, I think the, the board DCA is working very hard to streamline uh, to reduce the time involved, but keeping a fee the same for year after year after year is not really reasonable in any business. Um, so I'm not really sure how the board would stay solvent if it's costing them, you know, a certain amount and leaving that fee at $56. Uh, so that's all I had. Oh, and I did, um, I understand the finer points of a, of a class or a lecture can change and that is not necessarily presented in the outline. Um, however, uh, you know, after a few years, perhaps courses need to reevaluate if there should be more change in the course. Um, you know, if you take a concept such as, uh, you know, doing a repositioning maneuver, and if the eyes are, you see nystagmus that's ageotropic, you know, and we used to think that that meant a certain thing, and now you read the literature, and that's not, perhaps not the case that is a really big discussion and that's a really big change and that's a big change in your practice and your policy and what you're looking for. So I just kind of wanted to throw that out there while the finer details can change, uh, which I understand after a few years, perhaps we need to um, uh, be looking at if, if more changes, more in depth or critical changes have really occurred. And that's all I have, thank you. Thank you for that. Is there any further discussion from the board? Uh, hearing none, I have one uh, request. Mr. Sweet, um, may I propose a friendly amendment to your proposal um, that we add uh, without a fee cap to, to that motion? Yes, of course. Do we do we need to reiterate the entire motion? Sure, you could restate it, Mr. Sweet. 
I would make a motion to set the uh, hourly rate for CE at $116 per hour of instruction with no fee cap as recommended by Matrix. Do we need another second? Dr. Daniels, do you have any objections to the friendly amendment? No, I second. Good catch, Dr. Ferris. So accepted. Thank you. Hearing no further discussion, Mr. Sweet, would you please call for the vote? Yes. Dr. Paris? Yes. Dr. Adams? Yes. Raphael Sweet? Yes. Ms. Cruz? Yes. Dr. Daniels? Yes. Uh, motion passes. Thank you. I would um, ask if I might also entertain a motion um, that we continue to charge the same fee to renew a license as active or inactive. Can you, can you repeat that, Dr. Paris? I see you not correct. Um, Dr. Adams, we're now on policy decision number two, and Dr. Paris is asking for a possible motion um, to keep the uh, renewal fees the same as an active or an active license. Can you hear me okay? Yes. And if I may, can I add context to that motion? The, the, the reason I think we, we need this motion is because of, because of the bill um, and that we don't know how we may be affected um, later on through legislation. And so I, I think at this stage, it, it behooves us to have a motion where we can set it um, as the same fee, whether it's active or inactive license. Dr. Paris, this is Dr. Adams. May I ask for a clarification on yes. the comment that I made earlier about based on the acupuncture board, do we include that in a motion now that we would like to have our active license and inactive license fees to be the same? And then the caveat, or is that something that has to go through a different vehicle? Um, clarify that for me. I'm well, well, like like the, like the acupuncture board, like the acupuncture board says, they charge five hundred for their fee, but they said, but you know, can go up to seven hundred and seventy-five. As I as I recall, yeah. giving them giving them flexibility. Uh, yeah, I understood. I'm sorry. Yes. So the uh, policy question number three is in regards to the flexibility. And uh, my my intent was to have uh, separate motions for each of those. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I motion that we uh, accept the proposed renewal fee, and as outlined by Matrix, and have our active and inactive license fees um, the same. Thank you. Is there a second? Oh, I would like to second. Is there any discussion amongst the board? Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, Dr. Paris. Uh, sorry, this is Raphael Sweet. Uh, can, yes. can you just clarify? Um, you made a couple comments about the anticipated legislation that was coming up and how that might affect things. Can you just um, expand on that a little bit more for me? I'm having a harder time with this one as far as figuring out um, which way to go. Yeah, sure. And and I think maybe if if you don't mind, Ms. McMillan, if I'll, I I would like her to. Can you go over 
Uh, SB 1031, yeah. yeah. Okay. okay, this is Andrea McMillan. So I'll just provide you a, a brief update on um, SB 1031, which was authored by Senator Choa Bo, and it's now in the Appropriations um, Committee uh, in the Senate. And this bill would limit the board's inactive license fee to no more than half of the active license fee. Um, staff is supportive of the intent to provide financial relief to licensees tra transitioning from an active to inactive status. However, this bill would reduce the board's inactive license fee by half, which would result in a revenue loss of about $219,000 a year. And the board would need to increase um, a fee, um, the active license fee to cover for the revenue loss. So even though this fee has a huge negative uh, impact upon the board's budget, um, you know, staff has has had internal um, discussions about this, and we were recommending taking a neutral position um, and addressing the annual uh, renewal uh, fee for active and inactive license fees um, in the board's proposed um, uh, fee schedule, which we kind of have uh, been having this discussion. And uh, just to kind of give you a little bit of a background on this, um, like I said earlier, a lot of boards are concerned with this fee because um, it would have uh, a Substantial negative impact, um, you know, taking a, quite a bit of uh, revenue from the funds. And obviously, we are a small board and have very limited resources, and that would impact us um, greatly as well. Uh, but because we are seeking to increase our fees in the future, we are hoping that maybe we can uh, work something in um, here where we can possibly um, increase um, active license fees um, to cover up basically for the, the, the fee that we, or the income that we wouldn't be getting from the uh, inactive license fees. Uh, so that's kind of like a brief update on that. Let me know if you have any additional questions on that. Um, this is Dixie again. Um, I just was notified by Deborah Matos that um, SB 1031 died in appropriations oh. yesterday. Oh. Um, it was held in committee, and Thank they're you. talking a lot about it. So okay, um, well, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> I've been tracking the status, but I was not aware that it died. So that's good to know. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> and Mr. Sweet, right now the uh, active and inactive fees are the same right now at three thirteen. Is, is there any Thank further you. discussion? Any further discussion or questions from the board members? A hearing none, moderator, could we please open uh, this motion up for public comment? Certainly. We've opened up the Q&A feature of WebEx. If you would like to make a comment and you are connected by WebEx, you can look for the question mark icon in the lower right corner of your computer screen or behind the three dot other options if you're on a mobile device. And at this point, I will go ahead and step through the in-person locations to see if there are any public comments there. Uh, Dr. Paris, are there any public comments in North Market Street Boulevard, Sacramento? No. Thank you. Ms. Cruz, are there any requests for public comment from the South S Street Sacramento location? No. Thank you. Mr. Sweet, are there any requests for comment in North Hollywood? No. Thank you. Dr. Daniels, any public requests for comment in San Jose? No. Thank you. And Dr. Adams, any requests for public comment in Sonoma? No. Thank you very much. We do have a request for public comment from uh, Lori Eisenberg. And Lori, I'm going to send you a request to unmute your microphone and you will have three minutes to speak. You're unmuted. Hello again. Um, I just wanna add a comment that I had in my notes but neglected to speak at my last opportunity. Um, which is that once you, this concerns the continuing education fees. 
Um, just to let you know, in case you're not aware, um, if you have a one or a two credit course, then that's in line with the other 50 states. But once you move to three credits and above, California will be the single most expensive state in the United States uh, for continuing education. And moving to a course that's eight to 12 hours or above, the fee structure as approved a moment ago will put us 10 times or more, 10 times uh, the average fee charged by any other state. So I just want all of you to understand that, that it will change the landscape of continuing education in California. That's all I have to say. Thank you. And there are no further requests for public comment from WebEx. Shall I close the Q&A feature? Please, thank you. You're welcome. So I'd, I'd like to also um, entertain a motion that uh, the board request the fee schedule with the initial fee rates set in statute and the authority to adjust further the fees if necessary through the regulatory process. That's number three, Dr. Perry. That's number three. Uh, we need to vote on number two. Oh, I'm, oh my gosh. I'm sorry. Forgive me. <clears throat> myself. Let, let's circle back. Let's like, circle back. Yeah. So, so the motion before the board is, I think it was uh, Dr. Adams made the first and Dr. Paris was the second. Uh, it was to keep the, the license uh, fees the same for an active and inactive license. Yes, thank you. Is there any further discussion from the board members? Hearing none. Hearing none, Mr. Sweet, would you please call for the vote? Yes. Dr. Paris? Yes. Dr. Adams? Yes. Rafael Sweet? Yes. Ms. Cruz? Yes. Dr. Daniels? Yes. Motion carries. Motion carries. Thank you. Uh, moving to uh, policy issue number three, um, if I could entertain a motion um, that the board requests a fee schedule with the initial fee rate set in statute and the authority to further adjust the fees if necessary through the regulatory process. If I could add um, just a little context to that motion, I, I believe it reflects the flexibility that um, some of some of the board members have mentioned and that we've um, discussed in our ability to um, amend some of the fees um, up or down as our fiscal situation improves um, and also gives us the ability to uh, through the through the larger regulatory package um, adjust uh, any of the fees, including in, in CE, through some of the issues we discussed with, um, you know, uh, renewing courses that stay the same and uh, maybe some of the, as was mentioned by our stakeholder um, public comment that, you know, maybe addressing some of the issues of uh, large events, et cetera. So just for clarification, um, that motion would include uh, lowering fees that may be required commensurate to or increasing as as indicated by our fiscal situation, correct? Yes, the, the motion would be, um, it would set our fee schedule with the initial fee rate um, set in statute and then the authority to further adjust the fees if necessary through the regulatory process. 
my intention is to um, provide uh, some flexibility as needed as we move forward. And I think as was mentioned multiple times, um, we, you know, we had fees that we couldn't, uh, we weren't very nimble in our ability to um, address fiscal issues. And so I think this would help us uh, provide that ability. And, and Dr. Adams, to your point, um, if the fee is set in statute, the board would have the ability to kind of push it up or down depending on what that specific amount was. So if it's like 600, it could go up to 600, but it can also lower it to 250 or 300, for example. And would that include the decision that we just made relative to the cost of CE if it's determined that that, uh, as Ms. Eisenberg pointed out, potentially a tenfold increase over any other state in the union, if that's determined to be, uh, that could be lowered as well? Well, I think this is going to be like a two-phase approach. I mean, we'd have to get the, the change in statute, but then you'd have to also go through the regulatory process to kind of set it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I'm happy to make the motion as uh, as indicated by Dr. Paris, I don't, I don't do, I, do I need to repeat it? I don't have the words. I mean, maybe he can uh, if it's if it's on the record. Um, I make a motion the as motion was. Would you like me to state it? Sir, as stated, yes. Thank you, as stated. Do we have a second? I'm sorry, can. can is it possible for the for the motion to be restated just so that I can hear it again? Yes. Um, motion that the board request a fee schedule with the initial fee rate set in statute and the authority to further adjust the fees if necessary through the regulatory process. All second. Thank you. Is there any discussion amongst the board members? Hearing none, moderator, can we please open um, public comment and can we please um, address this motion with public comment at this time? Certainly. And for those attending via WebEx, you may raise your hand by using the raise hand icon or click into the question mark inside a box Q&A option and type the word comment. But first, I will take a sweep of the physical locations. Is there any request for public comment at the North Market Boulevard Sacramento location? No, no. Thank you. Any requests for comment at the South S Street Sacramento location? No. Thank you. Any requests for comment at the North Hollywood location? No. Thank you. Any requests at the San Jose location? No. Thank you. Any requests at the Sonoma location? No. Thank you. We do have a request for comment uh, via WebEx. Matt Nishimi, Nishimine, I will send you a request on unmute your microphone and you will have three minutes to speak. And you're unmuted. At Nishimini, and I'm with the DCA budget office. I was hoping to actually jump in and do this discussion before the public comment period. Um, so if you could just indulge me with this motion as it is now, the floor, what you are doing is you would be establishing a floor statutorily with the with the fee levels in the matrix study. To the extent you want to increase those fees, you also need to have a statutory cap. So I haven't heard that language or that proposal uh, explicitly that you have a statutory cap here. That's how you would do it regulatorily. And just to provide a little extra background, so my main job is I uh, manage all the economic and fiscal impacts for all the regulations going through DCA. And we do these fee studies, these fee adjustments um, all, the, all the time, most all the programs have their fees set statutorily and regulatorily. Okay. 
Um, and he can he make that? No. So, um, so, let's, it, it, what, uh, moderator, is there any other public comment right now at this time? No, there is no other request for public comment, and I can leave Matt unmuted for now until the discussion completes. Okay. Let's close the queue for the time being. Thank you. So I, um, I would entertain a friendly amendment to the motion to include a statutory cap. So Dr. Adams, uh, you were the maker of the motion. Do you have any objection? I, I do now, just because I wanna clarify something that he said. I heard, sure. and I may have not, and you know, I, and maybe he can chime in on this. Did I hear him say that the matrix fees that were proposed were the floor and that then the statutory has a cap going up? I was under the impression that we had the ability to adjust fees up or down depending, on, uh, depending upon our fiscal circumstance. Is that not accurate? Let me clarify, thank you. So the board is here to make that policy decision on what statutory levels, fee levels you want. And it was my understanding that the proposed fee levels in the matrix were going to be the baseline or the floor. And the advantage of having a floor and a cap on, so let me just give you some more context. So I also, um, shepherded the acupuncture board's fee, uh, fee adjustment two years ago through the process, through the statutory process. And I'm a big fan of the floor and the cap, the range model, because it does provide you operational flexibility moving forward to make decisions as you move forward and policy decisions and operational decisions. So currently, if you're looking at your business and professions code 1006.5, your fees are set in statute. So specified fee would be set at a specified level. And that's what it is. So you don't need regulations in addition to your statutory provisions. If you have a range, for example, if you went from $100 to $200, the floor would be, in, would be effective upon enactment of that bill. So January 1, upon enactment, the $100 floor would be affected. And then you board members would have the ability to increase that fee through regulations up to the 200, up to the cap, or anywhere in between. So the advantage of, of doing a floor and a cap is that the floor becomes effective immediately upon enactment of that bill. You do not have to promulgate regulations immediately. I would do it concurrently, but uh, once the bill becomes effective, then that floor becomes uh, the, the new fee levels. Thank you. So I'll amend the uh, motion whatever the floor is for a particular. With a statutory cap, and I don't know if we need to have a discussion or you want me to just arbitrarily pick a, a, a number of, we didn't get any direction on that, but I think it's reasonable to uh, think in terms of no more than 100% increase. So I would say up to a cap of 650. Um, Dr. Adams, the staff recommendation as far as setting statutory caps is generally to take to take the fee schedule proposed by Matrix and set set fees for the majority of our services, but then allow a 
range and a statutory maximum for the DC license renewal fee, as that's our primary driver for funding. And we'd like to see that cap somewhere in the $400 to $500 range. Um, so initially setting it at 336 and then setting um, a cap of 400, 450, $500, somewhere in there to allow us further flexibility in case we ever. Lost you. Lost you, Kristen. Yeah, sorry, we're having a little technical difficulty here. Um, I'm not sure at which point that I cut off, but the staff recommendation is to primarily to set to set the fees for the majority of our services, but then for the doctor of chiropractic annual license renewal fee, that's where um, it would be beneficial if we set the floor at the 336 level as recommended by Matrix, but then including within the statute authority to raise that fee to a higher level, such as $400, $450, or $500 to allow in case, you know, if we're put in a position where we need to increase fees, we can increase that fee through the regulatory process. Okay, so then I'll I'll take the st the staff and I'll sit, uh, council and and uh, amend the um, the motion to a cap of five hundred dollars. I'll second that, Paris. Dr. Daniels. Dr. Daniels, I see your hand up. Please. Yeah, I'm just I'm concerned of the cap of 500. Not that I want to be charging that per se, but I mean, are we looking far enough into the future to create the flexibility that we need with economic changes? Um, I, I just I would like to hear some reasoning behind the cap of of 500 compared to the acupuncture board, which I think was 750. So for the, the acupuncture board, their fees, they're on a two year renewal cycle. So their $500 covers two years and 775 um, is their maximum. With We have um, actually higher expenditures at BCE. So our fees are, are higher than what the acupuncture board has. Um, just in line with our costs, but that at $400 or $500 certainly provides the board with sufficient flexibility to ensure long-term uh, funding. We we were at $250, it went up to $300, then it went up to $313, and we're at $336. So certainly $500 provides plenty of flexibility for the board um, looking long-term. Okay. Thank you. And this is the moderator and Matt, you are still unmuted. Very good. And I would just want to dovetail off what Ms. Walker just said. Um, the matrix study does provide uh, for the um, increase in your fund balance reserve. So it does build in um, some additional uh, flexibility for you to one repay your loan to the uh, Bureau of Automotive Repair and to build a prudent reserve. So there is some natural growth already built into the model. Thank you. Is there any further discussion from board members? Um, hearing none, Mr. Sweet, would you please call for the vote? Yes, Dr. Paris? Yes. Dr. Adams? Yes. yes. Raphael Sweet? Yes. Ms. Cruz? Yes. Dr. Daniels? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you. And the rest of the uh, so I would um, 
like to ask to entertain one final motion, uh, a motion to adopt the remainder of the fee schedule as recommended by Matrix Consulting. I'll make that motion as stated. Thank you. Is there a second? This is Dr. Daniels. I'll second. Thank you. Any discussion from the board members? Hearing none, uh, moderator, can we please open this motion for public comment? Certainly. If you are attending through WebEx, we've opened up the Q&A option, the question and answer. You can look for the question mark icon and type the word comment in the text field and click send. And I will go ahead and touch base with the physical locations as well. On the North Market Boulevard location in Sacramento, do we have any public comment? No. Thank you. At the South S Street Sacramento location, do we have any public comment? No. Thank you. In North Hollywood, do we have any public comment? No. Thank you. In San Jose, do we have any public comment? No. Thank you. In Sonoma, do we have any public comment? No. Thank you. And I do not see any requests for comment from the WebEx attendees. Shall I close the Q&A feature? Yes, please. Thank you. You're welcome. Mr. Sweet, would you please call for the vote? Yes. Dr. Paris? Yes. Dr. Adams? Aye. Rafael Sweet? Yes. Ms. Cruz? Yes. <clears throat> Dr. Daniels? Yes. Thank you. Motion carries. Okay, thank you for that. Um, thank you for the public comment. Moving on to agenda item number three, review, discussion, and possible action on legislation. And we have Andrea McMillan here, who's present uh, for us. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. So um, I'll be providing a, uh, an update on current legislation um, that the board has been tracking. Um, and you may feel free to take the position if you um, decide to do so. So I'll go ahead and start off with um, Assembly Bill AB 646, um, which is a two-year bill that was authored by Assembly Member Lowe, and it's been referred to the Senate Business and Professions um, Committee. Um, AB 646 would require a board within the Department of Consumer Affairs to update or remove information posted on the board's online uh, license search system about a revoked license within 90 days of receiving an expungement order related to a criminal conviction. So um, this bill's intent is to increase access to licensed professionals by removing employment um, barriers. And uh, the board took a watch position at last year at the July 16th, uh, 2021 board meeting um, staff recommends maintaining this position because the board may be limited to uh, provide information regarding disciplinary action to a consumer who would want to request that information ahead of time when or prior to receiving um, uh, treatment, chiropractic treat treatment. So because of those reasons, we uh, recommend that we still watch um, that bill and um, staff would continue to monitor the status and um, see if there are any progress or developments on that bill at this point. I'd be happy to entertain any questions you may have. Are there any questions on our position or that 
legislation, proposed legislation. Okay, hearing none, let's 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 move on. Okay. Thank you. No problem. So the next uh, bill that I wanted to uh, go ahead and um, address is AB 1662, uh, which was authored by Assemblymember Gibson. And it actually progressed out of the Assembly uh, Appropriations Committee and is now, it has been now referred to the Assembly floor for third reading. Um, AB 1662 would require a board within VCA to establish a process for a prospective applicant who has been convicted of a crime to request a pre application determination as to whether that crime would disqualify them from licensure. Um, staff is supportive of the intent to inform prospective applicants of the possibilities of gaining um, licensure before they invest um, any time and resources into, um, you know, chiropractic education, um, training, or even going through the application process and having to pay um, a fee. Um, however, this bill does not um, include the board in the list of VCA boards and bureaus authorized to conduct a fingerprint background check on the prospective applicant seeking a pre-application determination. Um, and because of that reason, uh, staff recommends a support if amended position to make it clear in this bill, the way it's written, that the board would be authorized to request fingerprints prior to issuing uh, determination to the applicant. Um, so for those reasons, we recommend that we support this position. We think that there's value in this um, process that's being um, introduced or, or suggested by the legislature. but. Uh, we would definitely like to be included in that statute, um, which is BPC section 144, so we can have the ability to um, review and request fingerprints uh, when we conduct a background check. Let me know if you have any questions. I, I have a quick I have question. This is Doug. Oh, go ahead. No, please go ahead. Uh, this Mr. is Raphael Sweet. Um, are any other of uh, Boards in the healing arts um, seeking that same amendment? Uh, no, um, and uh, because of reviewing this, um, the list of boards and bureaus within that uh, statute, um, I believe most of them are already included. And I noticed that the Board of Chiropractic um, Examiners is not uh, for some reason. I think Dixie wanted to add something to that. Um, so the reason that we're not included is because at the time that um, this piece of legislation that included all the boards and bureaus um, was drafted, we, the Board of Chiropractic Examiners, was, were not part of consumer affairs. So um, it wasn't until more recently that we, the Governor Brown um, did the reorganization plan and put our board under the Department of Consumer Affairs. And I might, uh, we did um, talk to the author's office and we've been working uh, with um, legislative staff on this. Um, so they are aware of our concern and uh, we're hoping that there will be an amendment so we can uh, get included um, and that wouldn't be a concern for us. Thank you for that. Thank you. No so if I could just um, make a clarification statement. So the bill would also amend business and professions code 144 to include us. That's what we, correct. Uh, that's what we would want to support if that amendment was, uh, would be made because if not, we wouldn't be able to ha um, actually like when we conduct this background check um, and go through the process, we wouldn't be able to provide an accurate um, you know, determination, not being able to provide, to look at, you know, a more independent, um, you know, background uh, check, as opposed to just solely relying on um, information that's provided by the applicant. I have one other question. So does this bill also account for, did we do any analysis on whether or not the $50 to administer this section is, does that, how does that relate to our anticipated cost? So we, we did initially um, have a fiscal impact on this bill, um, and uh, the determination was that for each request, um, and you know, it takes time for staff to review this, which is probably about the same uh, time that it would take for a, a current uh, process for background check for an applicant right now. So it was determined that it would be $600 per request. 
Um, we don't know exactly how, what's the volume, but estimating it could be anywhere from 20 to 25 applications a year. And if that's the case, it could, we're probably talking $14,000 a year um, in um, possibly um, revenue loss. But then the $50 that you're talking about, that would be to cover like the, the process to review the application. But, you know, as you see, there is a, a little bit of a gap you know, so it wouldn't necessarily uh, cover the entire cost to review the application cost. So if I'm understanding, we would be um, negative $450 every time. Somebody... Correct. I might add that our recent um, stats on the number of applications that have um, the convictions are lower than the 20 or 25 per year that's cited. So okay. um, I think we're looking at a lot less. It's just an est estimate. Um, we're just estimating, but but it could be less than that, yeah. Um, can I request um, our next meeting? We have a little better, um, like a, a better idea of what those, what that number actually, we might anticipate that reflects out to. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah, I think we spent a lot of time on the budget today and, and, uh, and this, I, th I think if that potentially reflects uh, a lot of money for us. And maybe we can just, the amendment may be larger. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if, we, if we're supportive amended, maybe we just add something to that. Yeah. To cover costs, yeah. Okay, thank you. Are there any further questions on AB 1662? Helen? Hearing none, I will we'll let you move on. Okay. So the moving on to AB 1733, um, it was authored by Assemblymember Quirk, and it's been referred to the Assembly Committee on Governmental Organization. Um, this bill would amend the Bagley Keene Act to allow state agencies to hold a, a meeting entirely um, by teleconference as defined. Um, this bill would also specify that the public should um, have a means to address the board during a teleconference meeting, among, uh, among other things as well. Um, the overall goal of this bill is to increase uh, public um, participation by facilitating meetings uh, in a similar, similar manner as they were conducted under the governor's uh, executive order resulting from the COVID uh, pandemic. Um, however, um, I want to note that, you know, aside from having these meetings being held uh, entirely by teleconference, there is also a requirement that we would have to have a physical location available at every meeting uh, for the public to attend and address the board as well. Um, and then, and so what our position is or recommendation to the board is, is we're supporting this bill because we're, um, we're supportive of the intent to promote more engagement in our meetings. And also, um, I believe this bill would possibly result in uh, cost savings to the board of approximately $20,000 a year uh, per, um, by reducing, you know, uh, costs associated with traveling for staff and board members, you know, when we go to meetings and, and things of that nature. So um, it would definitely uh, save us some money there. Um, so for, the, for those reasons, we're recommending a support position on this bill. And let me know if you have any questions. This is Dr. Paris. I have a question. Um, so this bill would not in any way, uh, maybe enhances our ability to implement our plan to have um, two face-to-face -face board meetings a year still, and, and okay. Yes, so that's correct. Right. Yeah. And um, I don't know if I heard, it, it's, in, it's in our packet, but in this, we potentially expect to save about 20,000 yes. a year, even with our current model where we plan to be face-to-face -face twice a year. Yes, that, that is correct. Because that's, uh, we had an analysis um, on, you know, costs associated with traveling and, uh, we kind of compared what in-person meetings um, are versus teleconferencing and, you know, how much money we would be saving and reviewing those costs and looking at everything, we, uh, 
we were able to identify that we are actually saving about $20,000 a year uh, by, you know, not having staff or board members traveling for every board meeting. Thank you. One last um, question. Was there, so I heard um, we would have to have one location, mm -hmm. uh, one public location. Correct. And is there any consideration of uh, geography there? Is it just anywhere in the state? Yes, I believe so. Um, so depending on where we want to hold a meeting, as long as we have a physical location available uh, wherever we decide to have the meeting, um, you know, even if it's like a teleconference, but we would just have to ensure that we have a room uh, available to uh, the public. And like say, I'm thinking like if we have tele teleconference uh, meetings here at the CA DCA headquarters, then we would automatically have a room that we currently hold our meetings in. Uh, we can provide that um, and facilitate those meetings there. So, thank you. Yeah. Are there any further questions um, from the board members? Okay, thanks. Um, the next bill would have been 10, SB 1031, which we have already addressed and um, just learned that that bill died. So we don't have to really worry about that one anymore. So I'll go ahead and move on to SB 1237, which was authored by Senator Josh Newsom, and it's been referred to the Business and Professions Committee. Um, it's in the assembly. Um, this bill would clarify the definition of active duty to include members of the military called to active duty, to be eligible for a waiver of, of renewal fees, continuing education requirements, and other renewal requirements. The, the, bill, um, the bill's intent is to expand the provisions for a fee waiver uh, for members of the military and also to ease some of the burden uh, placed on these members um, who are oftentimes required to maintain license um, their license and uh, pay for fees. And I'm talking about the members who are like uh, in the military, but more like in a permanent uh, position. And historically, the board does not receive a significant number of fee uh, waiver requests for, board, uh, for members in the military. So um, we're currently recommending um, just to take a watch position on this bill because it does not currently impact our board operations and um, it doesn't really have a significant fiscal impact. Um, so for those reasons, we are recommending a watch position at this time. Any questions for Ms. McMillan? Okay, I'll go ahead and move on to SB 1365, which was authored by Senator Jones and it's in the Senate's Appropriations Committee. Um, SB 1365 would require the board or a board within the CA to post on its website a list of criteria used to evaluate applicants with a criminal record. Uh, this bill would also require DCA to assist um, each board in developing processes that would provide applicants valid information about how a conviction could be evaluated during the licensure process. Um, the bill's intent is to increase transparency uh, regarding the licensing process and um, our recommendation, however, is to watch this bill because it's not clear that it, the intent is to override any current processes used by the board to assist these applicants during the application process. Additionally, the cost associated with the implementa implementation of this bill is unknown, but this bill may have um, a, a negative impact on the board's budget. So it's definitely something to keep um, our eyes on and um, on our radar. So for those reasons, we recommend the watch position at this time. I'll be happy to enter entertain any questions you may have. All right, I'll go ahead and move forward um, to our last um, bill, which is SB 1434. Um, this bill was authored by Senator Ross, and it was referred to the Senate floor for a third reading. SB 1434 is the board's sunset bill, and it would um, expand the board's oversight review date by four years. This bill would also update the board's directory to include the telephone numbers and email addresses of licensees. 
This bill would um, require the board to submit a report to the legislature containing an update on the board's proposed fee schedule. And uh, least but not last, um, this bill would also remove specified exemptions from the status disclosure requirement for licensees placed on probation. So SB 1434 is intended to be a vehicle for the sunset extension of the board. This bill would improve um, board operations and enhance consumer protection by ensuring that patients are properly notified of the licensee's probationary status and they can make informed decisions prior to seeking um, chiropractic care. For these reasons, we support this position, uh, I'm sorry, this uh, bill, and, um, and we're hoping that you can also uh, agree and take that position. Yeah, that is the last one. And uh, if you have any questions, feel free to um, ask. Thank you. Are there any questions or discussions from the board members? Hearing none, um, might I entertain a motion that with the exception of uh, SB 1031, that we adopt the staff recommendation, recommended positions on the remaining bills? I'll make a motion to adopt the staff recommendations. Is there a second? I second. Is that Ms. Cruz? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Is there is there any further discussion from the board members? Hearing none, moderator, can we please open this motion for public comment? Certainly. We are opening up the Q&A feature of WebEx to facilitate public comment. If you are attending by WebEx, look for the question mark icon, typically in the lower right corner of your computer screen or behind the three dot other options, and type the word comment and click send. We will now step through the public locations are there any comments from the North Market location in Sacramento? No. Thank you. Are there any public comments from South S Street in Sacramento? No. Thank you. Are there any comments from North Hollywood? No. Thank you. Are there any public comments from San Jose? No. Thank you. Are there any public comments from Sonoma? No. Thank you. And I do not see any requests for comment through WebEx either. Shall I close the Q&A feature? Please, thank you. You're welcome. Um, any last minute discussion from the board members? And hearing none, Mr. Sweet, will you please call for the vote? Yes. Dr. Paris? Yes. Dr. Adams? Aye. Raphael Sweet? Yes. Ms. Cruz? Yes. Dr. Daniels? Yes. Thank you. Motion carries. Moving to agenda item number four, discussion and possible action on chair's proposal for the board to create separate licensing <clears throat> and continuing education committees. Um, briefly, I, I, I'm gonna make a few brief comments and then uh, allow Ms. Walker to um, kind of give us some examples of the issues that are separate and distinct between these two committees. And um, But before we do that, I, I just, the board currently has three standing committees and uh, licensing and continuing education committee uh, with um, Dr. Adams, 
Dr. Daniels. And we had Dr. McLean uh, recently has uh, resigned from the board. And so in the interim, uh, I, I'm gonna fill in as a chair of that committee until we uh, see the outcome of uh, this agenda item and uh, and maybe have to restructure some board positions if we have a new licensing committee. And uh, just our enforcement and scope of practice committee is uh, Chair Adams, Mr. Sweet, and Dr. Paris, myself. And our government and public affairs committee is chaired um, with Jeanette Cruz, Mr. Sweet, as our uh, member there also. And so if I could uh, ask Ms. Walker to go over some of the distinctions and, and as far as board staff responsibilities and uh, other items between the two. Sure, um, so as, as the board's currently structured, the Standing Committee on Licensing and Continuing edu Education um, has been, over the past few years, that committee's actually been primarily focused on developing the comprehensive changes to the board's continuing education requirements. That includes expanding the background check for CE providers, um, looking at the minimum requirements for those providers, Align, realigning and um, deciding what the mandatory course categories will be, um, as well as um, enabling that committee to have um, the authority to be hearing the appeals of denied CE provider and CE course applications. So there's a number of there's a number of significant efforts in the works as it as in regards to continuing education, not only um, at the committee level, but then also um, tasking that committee as serving as the appeal board. When there's a when there's questions about a course approval, um, with Dr. Paris's proposal, the functions of this existing standing committee would actually be divided between two separate committees, so that the standalone continuing education committee would continue on that mission of um, evaluating the continuing education course applications, um, the regulations. We would also, at the staff level, we would like that committee to provide oversight of staff auditing of continuing education records for licensees and continue and serve as that review committee for appeals of any um, applications that are denied by staff. Um, with the creation of the licensing committee, that committee would be focused on licensing activities for applicants and existing licensees, um, proposing regulations, policies and standards regarding chiropractic colleges, um, the doctors of chiropractic, satellite offices and corporation registrations. There's a number of issues before the board that I believe will be coming out of um, that have go, that have been brought up during sunset review and will likely come out of our strategic planning session that would be specifically related to licensing. Um, and it would, may be appropriate to have a separate standing committee solely dedicated to those functions. Um, so with that, um, the st staff certainly supports Dr. Paris's proposal and recommends that the board make a motion to create separate standing licensing committees and continuing education committees with those functions that are outlined in the meeting materials. Is there any discussion amongst the board members? Or is there anybody who would like to propose a motion? This is Dr. Adams. Sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. <clears throat> Uh, my only comment would be that my sense is, is and I, I'll just speak for myself, that uh, with the uh, kind of four board meetings, main board meetings, and, um, and adding another committee, maybe spreading us a little thin. Obviously, if we get some vacancies filled, that would be less of, a, of an issue. Um, but that, that's a little bit of my concern is just spreading ourselves a little thin and, and causing um, you know, more meetings uh, that perhaps we can consolidate some of those, those, those meetings and uh, you know, maybe take longer time for those committee meetings and address more issues all in one shot rather than smaller meetings spread out more frequently. That's my two cents. Thank you. Yeah, this is Dr. Daniels. Is yeah, I, yeah, I, I sort of had please. the same 
uh, concern. I mean, I'm in favor of it if it means kind of getting things done and moving things forward. I am a little concerned about spreading us a little thin. And I uh, just wanted to hear maybe more from you, Dr. Paris, of kind of what that would really look like. Um, you know, similar to Dr. Adams, you know, does the you know, committee meeting just need to be more organized and within that time, you know, half the time is spent on licensing, half is spent on the other, um, you know, a longer meeting. Uh, can you just uh, kind of give me some more of your thoughts around it? I'm not necessarily opposed. I'm only concerned about spreading us thin and extra time. Yeah, no, um, thank you for sharing both those thoughts. Um, I, I think the, the main idea here was that it's, um, A, we're doing the work um, of both committees um, no matter what. So first thing, you know, that work has to get done and the amount of time it takes is, is the amount of time relatively equivalent, I would say. Um, but the, the work has been somewhat separate and distinct and my sense was that uh, somehow the, uh, the licensing side uh, seemed to get overshadowed by sometimes the large um, continuing education issues that that we that tends to involve more of our stakeholders and and we had traditionally at least in the last few years um, we were looking at committee meetings where we were trying to uh, have focused agendas with maybe one or two items that we could really engage our stakeholders have deeper discussions and come out with um, you know really well developed. Uh, you know, develop the issues further, and and I think we're. If we look back at our continuing education meetings, um, it was hard to keep that within, um, you know, the two to three hour kind of range that we typically have traditionally allowed for committee uh, committee meetings, um, and so it was my sense that if if we could have, well, and I think too we could diversify our expertise. I mean, I, I should have said that up front. But I also feel like we could diversify the expertise of the board. And when we have, if when we get back to a full seven-member board, and um, you know, splitting those off into um, licensing and continuing education would actually keep those meetings a little bit shorter and more focused on you know the specific issues versus having um, essentially what felt like a full board meeting with you know just those two items. And I would note too, it's it's not going to be the same likely. I mean, it, it could be, um, but it, it doesn't. Ha you know, it's it, it's different. Not everybody's on the committee, so we're not burdening the full board. Um, you know, when we when we set up another committee meeting, it's just those who might have that interest or aptitude to serve on on that extra committee. But the work's being done either way. So I just and I want to note, you know, and I I felt like we've we've really, if we were to look at committee work between the three committees. Um, it's got to be in the 90th percentile that gets done in CE and, and the CE and licensing, I should say. So I think it's somewhat even uh, the, some parity in being able to offload those uh, committee members, you know, and let licensing run as a separate committee. Thank you. Is there any further discussion um, from the board? Thanks again. Um, if I may ask uh, it to entertain a, a motion or perhaps I'll, I'll go ahead and make a motion um, to create a licensing and a continuing education committee uh, with the functions as outlined in our packet. And, and also that, that that change take effect um, immediately upon approval, if it is approved. Uh -huh. Is there a second? I second, this is uh, Board Member Cruz. Thank you. Is there any further discussion? Comments from the board members? Okay. 
hearing none, moderator, can we please open this motion up for public comment? Certainly. We are opening up the Q&A feature of WebEx to allow for public comment. If you are attending by WebEx, look for the question mark icon, typically in the lower right corner of your WebEx computer screen. Type the word comment in the text box and click send. And before we go to the WebEx comments, we will touch base with our in-person locations. Is there any request for public comment from the North Market Boulevard Sacramento location? No. Thank you. Any requests for public comment from the South S Street Sacramento location? No. Thank you. Any requests for public comment from North Hollywood? No. Thank you. Any requests for public comment from San Jose? No. Thank you. Any requests for public comment from Sonoma? No. Thank you very much. And I see no requests for public comment from anyone on WebEx. Shall I close the public comment feature? Yes, please. Thank you. And if there's any further discussion from the board members. Okay, hearing none. Mr. Sweet, would you please call for the vote? Yes, Dr. Paris. Yes. Dr. Adams. Yes. Raphael Sweet. Yes. Ms. Cruz. Yes. Dr. Daniels. Yes. Motion carries. Thank you. Moving to agenda item. Number five, public comment for items not on the agenda. Moderator, can we please open for public comment? Certainly, we've opened up the Q&A feature of WebEx to uh, entertain items that have not been on the agenda. If you'd like to make a comment or speak, you can look for the question mark icon in the lower right corner of your WebEx screen, type the word comment and click send, or raise your hand by clicking the raise hand icon. I will also make sure that there are no requests from our in-person locations. Any requests at the North Market Boulevard Sacramento location? No. Thank you. Any requests for public comment at the South S Street Sacramento location? No. Thank you. Any requests for public comment from North Hollywood? No. Thank you. Any requests for public comment from San Jose? No. Thank you. Any requests for public comment from Sonoma? No. Thank you. And I do not see any raised hands or requests for comment from our WebEx participants. Shall I uh, close that section? Yes, please. Thank you. Moving to agenda item number six, future agenda items. Are there any members of the board who wish to submit a proposed agenda item? Um, I I do have one. I would like uh, I would like to see us add a discussion um, at our next board meeting regarding um, our uh, scheduling and how far in advance we would like to um, work on calendaring um, our meetings and notifications, et cetera. I concur. Yes, please. Duly noted, thank you. Um, moderator, can we please open uh, agenda item number six, future agenda items for public comment? Certainly, and we are opening up the Q&A feature. If you would like to suggest a future agenda item and you are attending by WebEx, look for the question mark inside a circle or at the 
bottom right corner of your WebEx screen. And again, I will touch base with the physical locations just in case. Are there any requests for uh, suggestions for future agenda items from the North Market Boulevard, Sacramento location? None. Thank you. From the South S Street, Sacramento location? No. Thank you. From North Hollywood? No. Thank you. From San Jose? No. Thank you. From Sonoma? No. Thank you. And no requests through WebEx, either by raised hands or the Q&A. Shall I close that feature? Yes, please. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, moving to agenda item seven, we're gonna go into closed session. Um, I would like to uh, call for a 10 minute, 10 minute break and uh, we will come back at, it looks like 218. If we could come back at 228 and, uh, and we'll begin our closed session and items interview candidates and discuss and take action. And this is the moderator. If you are a member of the public, the meeting will adjourn immediately after closed session ends. So there is no <laughs> further need to stay in the meeting and we will be um, dismissing people after the break. Thank you very much. Thank you.
And this is the moderator. We are preparing to go into closed session. At this point, anyone who is still a member of the public who is attending will be expelled from the meeting. And don't worry, you're not missing anything because the meeting will adjourn immediately after closed session. Thank you very much. And for the Board of Chiropractic Examiners and the uh, Human Resources staff, I am going to lock the room so that no one else can join, even if they did have the uh, website or the meeting address. So that will guarantee you are uh, private. I'm going to stop the recording and then I am going to withdraw from the meeting.